Um, hello and welcome to this pre-recorded live stream. Um, my name is Michael Boykowski uh, and this is the first in two videos where um, I'm taking a thesis project that I produce called Made of Stories and aiming to produce a sort of summary or a neat cohesive sort of um, explanation of the themes and ideas behind the, the thesis with the goal of creating like a performative lecture which will be the second part in this two-part video um, project. Um, I'm working in uh, OBS which is a live broadcasting software uh, and we have a number of inputs here which we can use. Um, so we've got sort of a, the big, whoops, wrong way, beginning of a keynote file over here. We've got um, somewhere to write some text and to work on scripts here. And then over in the far corner, um, we've got a browser in case we want to look stuff up on the web. Um, and we also have a camera just down here for if we want to make notes, we can scribble stuff down here. Um, and also this is just to give you an idea of um, former iterations of the thesis so far. It, it's actually produced as a printed publication. Um, you can see here, you can have a flick through. Um, the, the goal is sort of like to expand on this as well and create a second version of this publication. Um, but for now, we're just going to sort of go through various material and see what we can come up with as far as producing a um, performative lecture style thing. <laughs> um, so actually maybe it's good to look at the book for a sec. So the thesis is broken into sort of three main areas. Um, oh, actually, maybe this is good. Let's see if they're in here. <laughs> you can see this is a word work in progress. So one of the areas is nuclear semiotics. Um, uh, to explain nuclear semiotics uh, as simply as possible, this is actually the name for a series of projects. Um, let's get the browser working. Maybe we can look up nuclear semiotics in the browser too. I think, so this is Arena. If you don't know what Arena is, it's a place for collecting references and research. Uh, and in here, if I go to the index, I should have something about nuclear semiotics. So this video is also sort of a way to expose um, the research um, and building up of um, design research materials um, and how that comes together. Partially because, um, you know, in within Moving and Status and within um, a lot of the work produced by Design Academy students, um, there are quite a few areas that deal with immateriality. Uh, and the big question is then, like, how do you then <laughs> show it? So this is also an attempt to sort of deal with this idea of how do you communicate and share the immaterial rather than, instead of having a physical object to exhibit or to manifest how do you then um, express what you've been doing so I'm looking for nuclear semiotics I'm just sort of scrolling blindly here it is so I'm looking for just a really neat explanation which I can incorporate into this performative lecture um, I'm also based in Australia, so sometimes the internet connection is not fantastic. Um, where's the nearest? This might be a good place to start. A nuclear warning design. So you might, the, the first time I heard about nuclear semiotics was through a podcast um, that was talking about these design projects. I don't want to sign up to your newsletter. Um, that were initiated sort of in the, I think it was in the 80s and the 90s. Um, 
and they were looking at how to express places where nuclear waste is hidden for people, you know, 10,000, you know, um, 100,000, you know, a million years into the future. Um, on the assumption that, um, I might open this up in the thing. Yeah, on the, on the assumption that um, possibly, you know, there might not be the same language being spoken. Um, lingua franca, is that an expression people are familiar with? Maybe I'll type it in here. I think it's lingua franca. That doesn't look like lingua anything. We will look this up in our browser. So if I open another window. This multi-channel form of broadcasting is still something I am experimenting with. So um, it's probably a bit uh, janky. So lingua franca pretty much means um, the accepted most common language at a particular time. Well, that's what the expression has come to mean. That's how we use, or a lot of people use it at the moment. So, um, like in uh, like in the Netherlands, for instance, uh, an international, or a school that professes to be an international school will speak English or will have English as the primary language that um, everybody shares and you'll be expected to be able to speak English to continue the course. Um, so at some point English was determined to be this most common language that could easily be shared amongst um, people from many different backgrounds. So English in, in this case is the lingua, fran the lingua franca. Um, nuclear semiotics assumes that that's not something that's going to last forever, that <laughs> lingua francas change. Um, and we can't assume that uh, in that case, even written language or spoken language will be, common, will be the same as it is now. We just cannot assume how we communicate now will be the same as how we communicate in the future. At the same time, these projects don't aim to speculate on um, what could be understood in the future. Uh, it's more, these projects are more of an exercise in trying to imagine um, uh, ways we can communicate now that will be understood in the future. Um, so if I go back to Keynote, did I have some examples? I did not. I'm just like zooming through the three main <laughs> parts of what we're talking about. I think we'll stay on nuclear semiotics for now and we'll go back to the browser. Um, what is it doing? So nuclear warnings. Oh yeah, so I had this image up on screen. So this image in the corner here, turn my camera on and I can point to it for you. So here, <laughs> it's like disembodied hand. It feels very awkward trying to point in this way. Um, maybe we can make this bigger. Let's make this a bit bigger. That's better. Okay. So this was a project that suggested that um, certain plants could be bred that were a really unusual color. And um, they, the color, I think the idea was that the color reacted to um, radioactivity, radioactive material. So anywhere there was radioactive material buried or nuclear waste, these plants would be a certain color and a really unusual uh, resting color. Um, and this was thought to be a way that maybe we could communicate to people in the future that there was something different going on here, that this, there was something underneath here that was affecting the way the plants um, were growing. Um, then we flick through some more of these. Um, so 
there was a couple of these nuclear semiotics programs that were uh, initiated. I'll open up this image as well. So this is a illustration by Michael Brill and Safta Abidi. Where is it? So this was a suggest suggestion to build a spike field. So to to build some sort of structure over the top of where the nuclear waste was buried that was very striking and arresting in an alarming sort of way. <laughs> so this was a way of saying danger, like there's something going on in this area, keep away by having this sort of field of spike, spikes um, sticking up everywhere. The nuclear semiotics projects are interesting because um, although it was initiated by the US Department of Defense, um, actually, no, it wasn't UK, it was, correction, it was the nucle it was the US Department of Energy who were looking, who are continuing to look after this problem of um, nuclear waste in terms of where to put it and then how to let people know that it's there. Um, and, th like, obviously there's nuclear facilities all over the world, so these nuclear semiotics projects were particular to the US Department of Energy and to the United States in particular. Um, but yeah, they invited people from a wide a range of skills and backgrounds. So it wasn't necessarily scientists, it was like um, illustrators and science fiction writers and um, illustrators, um, architects. It was not your usual set of thinkers. <laughs> one, of, one of the references I found really useful is, uh, um, I wonder, maybe I can bring it up in another tab. So you might have heard of this idea of deep time. I wonder if this will bring up an image of the book that I'm thinking of. I feel like I've put a picture of it somewhere. Okay, this isn't showing us <laughs> the book. There's a book called Deep Time by an author called, um, how's this gonna test my memory now? It's not Billy Griffiths. Uh, who wrote Deep Time? Let's just put in Deep Time book. Okay, we're going to have to refer back to my notes here. I want this particular author because they actually also contributed to some of these nucleosemiotics projects. You know what? It's probably in here. We'll have a flick through this. And when I say this, I mean this. So it turns out that the printed version of the thesis is actually super helpful. And let's have a look at the... Oh, my goodness. So... So we see here Benford Gregory, Deep Time, How, human how Humanity Communicates a loss a Across Millennia. It's a bit of a dodgy read, like it's probably aged kind of a bit strangely in terms of um, modern politics and um, modern ideals, but it's a really solid attempt to uh, look at how communicate human communication has changed, um, you know, as far back as it can be documented with the idea that it will change again. You know, so going all the way back to cluniform, uh, and um, it'd be great to actually have the book in shot. That's something I haven't really taken into account of how to do. Um, let me just see if there's a reference in here.
Yeah, I I mean, <laughs> maybe uh, in the lecture version of this, I should include, definitely include, actually, I'm going to make that note of that, so include uh, reference to deep time book. Um, so this is a, I've already gone off on a sidetrack, huh? I should try and get us back on track. Um, let's pop this behind here. Whoops, that's gone too far. And maybe make this a bit smaller. No, that can stay where it is. This I don't think we need so big. Cool. Maybe that goes there and then that can, that can move over there. Yeah, so to try and surmise this area of the thesis, because it's just one part, you can see it's it's quite a nebulous part. We're looking at the entire history of human communication and how it's evolved, but also not, I mean, the book Deep Time looks at, suggests that it can evolve again. It doesn't say how it's going to evolve again. So it's not speculative at all. It's sort of tried to be all the nuclear semiotics projects, like they, they are speculative to a point, I think. Um, so you can imagine them sort of being real. I should mention one more <laughs> nuclear semiotics project. Um, no, I'm not. I'm not going to go into detail. I'm going to move on. This is a sort of a summation uh, to give me an idea of how much or how little we need to include in the presentation. So as I said, made of stories is made of stories. It's made of three main stories which kind of tie everything together. The first one is nuclear semiotics. The second, second field that we tell the story of is linguistic forensics. Um, and this is told via a discussion that was held at a place in Melbourne, Australia called the Wheeler Centre. Uh, let me see if I've got a description of this event. Because that would be super neat. Okay, so here we go. So uh, in a panel discussion entitled Pass It On at the Wheeler Centre in Melbourne, a group of academics and cultural producers met to, met to highlight the many concerns that are needed in addressing, needed to be addressed in facing the preservation of language. A key issue was the perceived absence of a shared written vocabulary that was readily available to be documented, archived and shared. So this is particular to, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's common to areas where there has been uh, a um, indigenous population or Aboriginal population that, um, whoops, that has sort of had to go through some sort of colonizing uh, period. Um, this in Australia, it's particular because um, there used to be a lot of different language groups for the Aboriginal population spread out across the the continent um, and through various colonial and potentially genocidal um, activities um, this map here was just uh, like completely sort of um, not completely but these different languages groups are all sort of split up and moved around and um, some were lost, some were depleted of people that actually could speak the languages. So um, there's a common map that uh, you can download, which is in the thesis. It's called the AIAT SIS um, organization map of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, language groups. It, the map itself is problematic because it follows Eurocentric mapping traditions down to the colours that are used to represent the different areas on the map. 
and it also assumes that um, that each language group had very definite sort of borders and hence a sense of ownership. Mo I feel like most Eurocentric maps, the types of maps that are common, that are that were spread throughout the world at a certain time, they mostly speak of ownership. They speak of um, geopolitical concerns and they speak of um, this, per this country owns this, you know. Um, Whereas when you're talking about language groups, I feel like it's a m more sort of uh, nebulous or maybe the boundaries are not as neat and tidy and like how much is language about ownership, I guess? How much of communication is about saying what is whose and what belongs to who? This was my reinterpretation of the uh, language groups map for Australia where it just sort of tried to do a version that blurred the boundaries and didn't make them so concrete. Um, so yeah, the, the, the issue that this group were discussing in this panel were what to do about um, preserving the languages that could be preserved, but also like um, how to capture those that were potentially lost or about to be lost due to, you know, depleted um, numbers of people that could speak those languages, you know. Um, and the, the topic moved on to this idea of before you can preserve a language, you have to identify it and define it and um, a few of the members of this group were talking about um, having dictionaries for different language groups and that this was maybe a sign when something was able to be preserved, if there was a dictionary of it. Um, so, yeah, there was a lot of talk, it's a nice diagram, <laughs> um, a lot of talk about preservation of particular words and ways of saying things and um, words that might mean different things in different uh, to different language groups etc etc the common thread was that and this is something that um, it's a very it's it tends to be a colonialized story of um, indigenous or aboriginal peoples having stories to tell of that sort of sustained knowledge so storytelling was seen as the type of communication. I mean, when it when that's discussed in colonial terms, it can be sort of infantile, infant, infantilizing of uh, Aboriginal Indigenous cultures that there was only storytelling and there wasn't this complexity of language, which language preservation and forensics tr is attempting to capture, you know, and represent. Um, I, I, there's a reference in here, let me find it, I'm using my phone a lot, I've realised. This is quite an, this is an experiment, this format. Um, let's see if I can find the rainbow serpent. I think I took it out, because I was worried about that infantilizing aspect, I did. So when, when I was a child, there was a, a, child, a book that won the Children's Book Prize um, uh, when I think I was about five years old or something when it won. Um, and it was the, called The Rainbow Serpent. And it was a storybook illustrated by an Aboriginal artist um, that told an Aboriginal story of how the world was created. Um, I mean, the, the amazing thing about The Rainbow Serpent is it was a story that was common across various, or it seemed to be common across various language groups. Can't say that for certain. Um, and it could be read lots of ways. It could actually be read as like a type of mapping or a type of um, sharing of um, information pertaining to locations or like how things were formed or made. It's also a creation story, which is what was the focus of the children's book, I guess. Um, but um, 
Yeah. I think the, the, the chapter title sort of sums up where uh, I sort of got to in terms of linguistic forensics relating to um, storytelling and the preservation of language. So when language fails, what's left is the story. And for Aboriginal and Indigenous um, people in this place we currently call Australia, um, even though that's the colonial name for it. <laughs> um, you know, even if the languages are um, under threat or disappeared or are um, hard to, you know, build a dictionary out of or work out how to preserve, there are stories that were told between language groups that were not only informational but also easily shared and maintained um, that was the other thing that you hear too which i don't know if i covered or not but i think they discussed in the um, pass it on uh, presentation was this idea of actually no it wasn't um, so there's a book by an author called patrick nunn called the edge of memory um, Okay, where he talks about sort of having a system for, for sharing and preserving stories. So in his book, Nunn says, Many Aboriginal people expressly state the imperative of telling a story the correct way, something that not only ensures its content is accurate, but also that the ownership of the story um, and with it the responsibility to pass it on through the patcher line is made explicit. So again, like one of the really tragic things about the colonial colonial project in Australia is that um, there's uh, it's depleted information about indigenous um, peoples due to um, uh, you know projects related to the genocide of <laughs> indigenous peoples uh, uh, in Australia. Um, so it makes it, you know, a lot of information is still being uncovered, still being exposed, um, still being discussed, although more discussion and more education is really um, important. Um, I will move on to the third part of this, which I've called Facing Narratology. It really was more the thesis investigates this idea of narratology. Um, for this, I might actually change our browser because I might find some diagrams. So yeah, there's a whole section. This will be, will it be huge? It should be huge. This was a really big area. I'm just going to close some windows. Oops, that's not the window I wanted. Okay. Maybe this is a good place to start. Get a nice big graphic on the screen, hopefully. This graphic appears in the book as well. See, it's cut off here. That's annoying. What if I click on it? Ah, it's just going to take us to the page. Maybe this is a good idea. So narratology is an academic study of narrative. Um, and it's, it has its roots in um, uh, early Russian constructivist, construct, uh, construct <laughs> it's not constructivist. <laughs> um, oh, I'm going to refer to my notes again. So maybe, maybe this is worth reading out in the presentation. Um, so 
narratology, narratology is not narration, it's not storytelling, and it's not fiction. Um, so if you are if you are interested in the field of design or if, if you're not um, speculative design is a very um, is a field with a lot of energy around it at the moment um, and it's this idea of um, speculating on fictional scenarios um, narratology is not necessarily about speculation it's um, looking at narration like how we tell stories not what the stories are um, and um, I should just read this. It's the study of the structures that support narration, storytelling, and fiction, not about narration, storytelling, or fiction. So how stories are made, how fiction is pieced together, um, how, sto how narration is expressed. Um, and it's in a really hyper-analytical way, like to the point of like creating these like intricate diagrams that break down words and topics and ideas into um, their sort of little compartments. There's an amazing, can you see that in the bottom corner? So this is the diet, this is a story that has been <laughs> through the narratology ringer. <laughs> this is a, a diagram by a, a um, uh, I guess an academic called uh, Perry Thorndike. Um, and this was a suggestion for ways to interpret literature um, and storytelling by creating these very elaborate sort of broken down um, expressions of various pieces of fiction. Um, my favorite thing in this diagram is, you know, can you see it? Cat agrees to scratch dog. Dog agrees to bark. <laughs> Cat scratches dog. <laughs> There's a monkey and a donkey. So there's a story about a farm and all the things that go on on the farm and it's broken down into like episodes, sub goals, attempts, outcomes, success. <laughs> um, give milk to cat, there's a sub goal. Uh, it's, it's like if you, if you read the original thing that this is based on, it's just a straightforward story, but this has been broken down into all its like crazy, crazy components. Um, I will read to you a criticism of this attempt, if I can find it. Um, so the realization often made the original literature these structures are based on seem redundant. So once you had this sort of structure, suddenly it was for some people it was completely detached from the original text it had become something completely new um, and had become its own particular structure even though it was based on an original um, piece of text um, so logan williams who was i think he was part of the buzz uh, like a buzzfeed program almost like a type of residency uh, like a journalism residency um, he looked at this diagram and said that it takes a simple story and renders it bewildering, bewilderingly complex. Um, and uh, he sort of was asking, what is gained from interpreting the original literature this way? Um, or is the structure designed for the story to inhabit more relevant, a more relevant, useful outcome? Um, So the thing that I thought was interesting and useful about narratology in relation to design was that um, these structures are designed. They take literature, like there's a lot of, um, particularly like my background is graphic design. So I, whoops, <laughs> I sort of look at these um, narratological, narratological structures and this is another version in the corner here. Sorry, I'll flip to that properly. So this is a, this is abstracted to the point where there are no there's no text involved at all anymore. It's literally just this sort of image. I should put this on the front actually. Let's move that to the front and move it up. So you see this and then this one facing here. 
Um, I th for the <laughs> for, to enhance the argument, I there was some sort of indication and key on these, and I've taken it off just to show that um, it's actually called the shape of the story. So this was a um, a group of they not designers but um, academics using design to explore um, different ways of interpreting stories and narratives. And they came up with this structure that created these sort of crazy, actually quite attractive diagrams. <laughs> so this is a piece of fiction, or this is a story, and it's been, design has enacted, been enacted upon this to create this. Um, I have to say at this point that um, part of my studies have also involved um, looking, actually writing stories, non-speculative stories, so I won't call them fiction at this stage, although they appear in the guise of fiction. Um, and it, it was pointed out to me by a <laughs> lecturer that, um, that even though it's not pictorial necessarily, or it, you know, it's not um, graphically designed, it's still designed. You know, a story is still designed. Uh, decisions are made as to how a story should evolve, and that creates a design. You describe a character, you've designed a character, you know? Um, a, as part of this um, thesis, there are examples of stories as well, uh, and there's a structure for how to create stories that are non-speculative, um, but also about design research, pretty much full of design research. I probably should have said at the start, actually. <laughs> the whole thing that um, propelled this thesis along was the idea that um, there is just this vast quantity of design projects and the research that supports this, these projects being produced and not necessarily captured in an, or um, transmitted in a way that um, made the most of the findings of this research and that um, I really want to address the churn I think you get from places like Design Academy where every year there's a whole raft of um, often amazing projects related to all sorts of amazing research pools that is produced and then sort of cleared away to make way for the next <laughs> huge raft of um, certain projects. I mean, um, thinking about this situation now with the moving in status um, uh, uh, show and program that we're currently um, working on, um, one of the things I've noticed with COVID is that shows and exhibitions are e have been elongated by being made to sort of be online and interact and be interactive with people online. So a lot of the time frames for exhibitions and shows have been stretched, even though you can't visit them physically, their embodiment is sort of stretched and elongated. So we have the rare and unusual benefit of um, being able to um, show you again what we've been working on and maybe even expand on it, which a lot of years previous wouldn't have had, like um, a lot of those research assignments lived and died <laughs> within the space of a year. Um, yeah, and um, you know, it's it becomes up to the individual how much they want to sort of push or propel a project often and um, a project might be really valid or useful or it might be relevant to somebody else's field that helps um, enlighten it or expand it. But um, if that project isn't allowed to be transmitted or shared or archived or kept, then it's it sort of disappears into the ether. Um, the, the Probably the other thing that made a stories want to address was also the over-dependence on material culture. I understand material can mean many things now, like it doesn't necessarily mean to be physical material. I, I'm talking in terms of uh, um, project outcomes that you can hold, touch, feel, see, smell, like that have a, a very physical presence. Um, uh, like 
one of the big questions in the last few years has been like, is it a good idea to bring more things into the world? Uh, if, even if you are someone that works in this field of producing material objects or physical objects, is it a good idea to then bring more of these things into the world considering the sort of environmental impact a lot of um, designed objects have had? Um, in which case, these sort of more immaterial research-based projects become even more relevant and potent and worthy of keeping and sharing and get, getting their life to be elongated or uh, extended beyond a mere, you know, 12 month um, research and thesis cycle. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a lot. Of, I've just done a lot of talking. I don't think I've made a presentation in this time. This, I mean, I wasn't sure what would happen, t to be honest. Um, what I think I would like to do actually is just clear some of this stuff away. Maybe we can use it like a screen and just put them all floating around down the bottom and then make this guy a lot bigger. And I'm just going to flick through this document because I can't remember what's in half of it. Um, and there might be some things that of interest. So we'll just have a quick flick through and then I might call it a session for now and then there'll be part two which will hopefully be much more polished and coherent um, after this. So for now I'm just going to quickly flick through this presentation see if there's anything else that I should really cover. So narratology, I think after introducing the main three topics that weave together this story of how design research can be transmitted and kept. Um, I then go into a bit more detail about each of the three topics. So as a refresher, the three topics covered in the thesis are the story of nuclear semiotics, a story about linguistic forensics, and then a sort of overview of what narratology is and how design fits into that. And those three segments, interwoven, present this idea of um, design research and how it can be kept and transmitted and hopefully given longev a longevity that a lot of um, uh, design research projects don't have at the moment. Um, I should skip to the end. There's another spike field project by Michael Brill and Safar. Uh, BD. The there's so many nuclear semiotics projects. There was an initial set produced by a particular company for the US Department of Energy in the 80s or 90s and then there was another sort of more independent group which involved um, a sort of wider range of creatives including a few artists who then did a second wave of these of similar but um, more out there projects. Um, this is another version of the AIATIS map that I mentioned earlier when we were talking about nuclear, uh, about uh, linguistic forensics. This one is just slightly blurred, um, but th this was another, and the colors have been slightly altered, so they're not um, hopefully avoiding that Eurocentricity. Um, this is something that I should cover in the presentation a bit more. I think this is kind of helpful. But this is a structure for creating stories based on um, fact-based embedded research. <laughs> so the idea that design research um, can be transmitted and archived and kept by being embedded within story structures that are not dependent on language necessarily. Um, and this was just a, a structure for embedding research into stories. Oh, and yeah, okay, this. I'm going to flick through this because I will go into more detail, I think, in the formal presentation. It's a bit slow. It must be those flips. <laughs> so, in supporting this storytelling structure there was a number of stories that were written 
Um, but I don't want to go into that, I don't think, because it just makes it more complicated. Let's see if we can skip ahead. Like, I'm all for complications <laughs> and making things really rich and dense. But um, I'm also in the habit of making things a little too com confusing when they could be a lot simpler. You know, though, that's pretty much the end. That's all the slides. That's weird. I think maybe I would like to... Maybe I should make these notes, actually. Let's just bring the camera to the front. Make this a bit bigger. And maybe have it turn on. It's, I'm using an iPhone here, so this is a feed from an iPhone. And it just keeps turning off, which is a little annoying. don't know how to stop it doing that. Probably a setting that I could turn on or off, which would be really helpful. And um, so I think the sort of structure is, so it's made, oh, I can't write, fresh page maybe. <laughs> the cord's getting caught up in everything. Um, I'm going to post some pictures of my actual setup to somewhere as well, because it's quite unusual. I'm sort of stuck, connected to all these different output devices in order to create this sort of seamless interface <laughs> um, so made of stories is the overarching sort of container for the thesis and then inside it there are three themes that explain that form the thesis so I call them three acts, which is kind of how we have set up made of moving in um, status as well. So there's three acts, three themes or acts. Uh, there's nuclear semiotics, and they all end with a summary, which kind of connects, adds is, connects one theme to the next thing. Um, there's linguistic. Forensics. My spelling is probably terrible, by the way. I'm kind of spelling for me and how I understand what I'm writing, <laughs> rather than for public consumption. And then narratology. So these all connect to a like container or design for non spec active stories I'm going to put all fictions because mostly because fictions is useful in terms of how people understand stories I guess but I don't necessarily like using the term fictions I have a little bit of problem with it um, it's a bit fuzzy, isn't it? Can it focus a bit better? Yeah, it's like it's focusing there, huh? So then it connects to there, and then I think there is like a statement about the value is a very loaded term. I don't know if I should be using the word value um, of this in facing design research as a I'm going to use burgeoning burgeoning field hey I think I think this is a structure for the next part I think this is I think this is helpful I think this has helped I feel happy about this <laughs> cool um, originally this, I was hoping this would be a live stream and that people could contribute as this was happening. I don't know, I'm crossing time streams, I'm sort of time zones, I'm in Melbourne, Australia at the moment, so um, I'm guessing our audience will be mostly in the Netherlands and Europe. Um, 
so maybe it's better this is pre-recorded I don't know but um, I'd like to offer the opportunity to contribute somehow I don't know if that means um, commenting on the recording of this when it goes live and I can be checking the comments and responding to them maybe that's a way to do it I'm not sure but um, we'll see for now uh, I would say thank you for mostly staying to this very end if you have <laughs> well done <laughs> and uh, yeah I will see you for part two um, of this remaking of made of stories thanks <laughs>